Let's talk more about herbivory and how plants are protected against herbivores. Because plants are rooted in the ground, they can't run away. They can't hide either because their leaves have to be exposed to catch light. In fact, they're usually too abundant to be cryptically colored. Usually it's them against which other things are camouflaged. So plant defenses have to operate in situ, either directly or indirectly. Here's a multi-purpose defense, hairiness. It can prevent an animal's mouth from biting the leaf or maybe even an insect from laying an egg on the leaf surface. Also, it can protect from too much intense ultraviolet radiation. There are four types of defense. Many people just say the first two, mechanical and chemical, but I think also biotic defenses and phenological are important. Any species of plant can use more than one of these and may use them at different times of its life. So hair, mechanical defenses include hairs, spines, thorns, which have different botanical derivations, and leaf toughness also is a mechanical defense. And then there are things like the fake eggs that, that passiflora plants make. They have them on their tendrils. It makes it look like heliconius butterflies have already laid eggs there when really they're just bumps on the surface of the plant. Spines can make plants very unpalatable, although maybe you remember Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh, the grouchy old donkey who loved to eat thistles. Here are some thorns that can prevent biting but also may deter climbing. Chemical defenses can be either those that influence palatability, maybe some kind of feeding inhibitors, those that affect digestibility, and toxins. Chemicals that influence palatability can act before a bite is taken. Maybe volatile compounds can repel herbivores, and then specialist herbivores may use those same volatiles as a cue to find the plants. And others act after the bite is taken. Tannins can make leaves astringent. Calcium oxalate crystals in aeroids, aeraceae, can cause animals to have sore throats, not be able to talk, and then leave the plants alone. They might be chemicals that make the herbivore photosensitive and blister and die or perhaps chemicals that release cyanide on chewing, cyanogenic glycosides. The digestibility reducers bind with the useful stuff in the plant food to keep the herbivores from assimilating. So herbivores eat a lot but grow very slowly, and they may fail to develop at the right time, and they also spend longer in the vulnerable larval stage more easily eaten by predators or attacked by parasitoids. Here are a couple of different caterpillars that have been parasitized. What we see now are the cocoons of the parasitic wasp larvae that emerge from the caterpillar and spin their own cocoons. And then there are toxins like the ones in milkweed where vertebrates eating the milkweed plants can get sick. It's not good for them, and most insects also avoid the foliage. But there are specialist herbivores, the caterpillars of monarchs, for example, eat milkweeds and sequester the toxins, and these toxins are even passed on to the adult butterflies. So certain specialists, like the monarchs, are adapted to feed despite the toxins. The cabbage Whites, the, a group of butterflies, love to eat things in the Brassicaceae with compounds that are repellent to many herbivores. Here's a temperate zone butterfly on the top, the cabbage white butterfly, and on the bottom, the common green-eyed white, common in Mexico and Central America. 
The leaves of the citrus family are repellent to most herbivores because of the essential oils that make them smell and taste funny, but certain swallowtail butterflies love them. The younger instars of the this giant swallowtail look like bird droppings. This particular one looks kind of like a snake head by this stage. And if you bother it, it puts out these scent horns, which are very repellent. And here's a local tropical milkweed with a monarch caterpillar with his aposematic coloration. Here's a the life cycle eating leaves and then pupating and through this series of photos you can see the adult eclosing or coming out of the pupa case. When they first hatch their leaves are wrinkled up so they need a couple hours to pump them up. But these adults benefit from the sequestered cardinalides too. And here's a innocent blue jay catching and munching a monarch after yumming down the middle fleshy part he retches because it's so toxic and he will remember and not eat them in the future this family of plants the Apocynaceae, has a number of such associations here's the paper white butterfly a really big paper kite butterfly that you can see in the butterfly house at Fairchild it's in the genus Idea and they eat Parsonsia which are plants from Taiwan, the caterpillar with its eposomatic coloration. And here's another one on Prestonia, a vine we have growing at Fairchild but studied in Costa Rica by Dan Jansen. We have an article about him in our class website too for you to look at. I can't resist these examples. Here's the Frangipani or Plumeria which is a host plant for a gigantic caterpillar, Pseudosphinx tetrio. Some people have suggested this caterpillar looks like a coral snake with its aposomatic coloration, and it is toxic. But squirrel cuckoos love to eat these caterpillars. They t catch them, whack them till the poisonous guts come out, and then eat them. So biotic protection is often overlooked, but we think it's pretty important. There's a lot of work done here at FIU about plants with nectaries that attract beneficial insects. Ants can protect plants, and parasitoids may also be attracted and parasitize the herbivores. Sometimes certain herbivores secrete honeydew, and they may be attended by ants that can then protect the plants. And mites also may be hosted by plants that can eat herbivorous mites or clean the plant surface. Here's a couple of species with extra floral nectaries. On the left, Turnera, cultivated commonly here in Miami, but you usually don't see the drops of nectar accumulated like this. Here in a greenhouse, it was protected from insects. And Visia sativa in England, the, at the base of the leaves are these little outgrowths called stipules, little leafy things, and on the stipule is a nectary. So you can see here ants visiting the nectaries. And here's Senna mexicana with a tiny ant at its nectaries. This is a plant Ian Jones has been studying for his PhD work. Lastly, there's phenological defense where certain plant parts are produced all at once or in great abundance to overwhelm the predators. Leaf flushing is a, an example of this, and masting, which can be flowering or fruiting every two to five years, synchronously with others of the same species. So here's a bunch of new leaves on a tropical tree, flushing with a reddish color. So herbivores may attack some, but there's so many around they may not eat them all. Here's some mahogany leaves flushing in Brazil, up in the canopy. And mast fruiting is called that. I used to think it was called mass fruiting, like all at once. But the mast tree in Great Britain is what they call beech trees. And a mast year is when the number of fruits beech nuts, hickory nuts, acorns, we get this here in Miami, or hazelnuts, 
produced in a single season is much higher than usual. So tons of acorn eaters might build up on these, and then when there aren't too many or none the next year, their populations will crash. So masting oaks, mast fruiting, preceded by mast flowering, a big year of acorns leads to more predators, but then no or very few acorns the next year, the predator populations will crash. This can affect the dynamics not only of the predators, but parasites associated with them. There's, for example, ticks that carry Lyme disease. And the food of one of my favorite animals, the panda, bamboos, have mast flowering, and also they're semiparous which means they flower, reproduce, and die. And here's a quote from the Assam Times. When bamboo flowers, famine, death, and destruction follows.